Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Phenomenal Families virtual series. Today we'll be having a discussion with a panel of astute, impeccable, well-accomplished ladies on family businesses, women in business, wealth building, etc. So I'd like to introduce each of the panel members um, this afternoon. We have Professor Elmarie Venter. She's a well-known presenter, facilitator, educator, mentor, and consultant in the field of family business. She is currently a member of the Department of Business Management at the Nelson Mandela University and is a founding member and director of the Nelson Mandela Family Business Unit, the first and only research unit of its kind in Africa. We have Ms. Doris Mbadwe, a constructpreneur for over 15 years, a second generation family business owner and leader, deputy managing director, co-owner of Interbao Construction Limited, a leading indigenous award-winning company in Nigeria, board member of Interbao Foundation, an NGO established to train women and youth in construction skills. We have Nancy Chen, who is the head of Bedell Christens International Private Client Practice, she is qualified as a lawyer in four jurisdictions, being Jersey, British Virgin Islands, England and Wales, and New Zealand. She has 20 years of experience advising on a wide range of offshore matters in both the private client area as well as the corporate sphere. In the private client sphere, Nancy advises ultra high net worth families, family offices and intermediaries on all aspects of private client structuring, including the use of grists, foundations, as well as related corporate law issues. We have Susi Mutendi, founder and lead consultant at NACA Legacy Planning, also co-founder of African Family Firms, the largest family business community on the African continent. She assists family businesses to build out multi-generational businesses, which turn into multi-generational legacies. She's a third-generation family business owner herself, and owner of a school and publishing company. We have Victoria Blackburn, part of the team at JTC Private Office, a JTC group service providing trusted advisory and family office services to high net worth individuals and ultra high net worth individuals and their families. Victoria has over 15 years experience in this field and works holistically with her clients to help them manage their business and personal administration needs enabling them to free up their time to focus on what is most important to them. Many of her clients are entrepreneurs, whilst others have significant inherited wealth. We have Tandeka Nombanjinji, founder of Mbokoro Building Pty Limited. She began her organization after understanding the dire requirement for female inclusivity inside the construction sector. The company was established for the sole motivation behind minimizing gender gaps and ensuring that females form part of an inclusive and equitable part of the construction industry. Thank you, ladies. So I'll start over with Professor Elmarie. I understand that you recently did a research study on women and family firms. What were the key findings in your study? I've been consulting to family businesses for, for about 15 years. And we have been doing research for a couple of years. And um, we also did a, a large um, research project on um, the role of women in family businesses. And perhaps as an introduction to this afternoon, just mention some of the varying roles of families, of, of women in family businesses, and then the unique challenges that they tell us that they face. So I uh, presented a few workshops on, on the role of women. And I remember I always do it with a financial planner. And he says that if you look at all the roles that a woman must fulfill, she's the mother, she's the chief emotional officer, psychologist, consultant, teacher. She's the administrative clerk, cook, taxi driver, welfare officer, motivator, co -preneur. And so you can go on and on. You must actually pay five times that the CEO earns. So that is just for interesting sake. So there are so many people or constituencies that rely on her. It's her children, her spouse, her business colleagues, the household, her business, her workers, her community. 
So women are really faced with many roles and sometimes it's very diverse. So if you specifically look at the roles that we found that women can play in a family business, and I'm sure the ladies on the group will give you very specific examples, then we see many uh, female business owners in their own right in family businesses, or they are co preneurs In other words, they work with their partners or their husbands in the business, they co-owners. What we found many times in consultations is you often have the jealous spouse sister or sister-in-law because due to the unfair division of tasks that they always uh, sometimes get in the family business. So they often assign the softer tasks and the softer, more invisible roles. And sometimes they're well educated and that really frustrates them. Um, I think a typical role that women play in family business is also that of the vice president of human resources. The, the woman or the mother keeps the whole family together and organize things in the, in the family business. Often the, the woman, um, especially because they cheap labor, and that's unfortunately how it is, they do the finances and the books. Um, and um, they often feel like they're the doormat or they, uh, because they're so nice. So women tend to be the nice uh, one in the family and that often frustrates them and makes them feel invisible. Um, and then, of course, more and more, uh, we see that all over the world, traditionally, women was not considered as, as successes, but that is definitely changing quite rapidly. Our research has also shown that you, uh, women in family businesses experience unique problems. And I think the first one is a problem that all women experience, and that is role conflict. Um, and work-life balance. And I'm sure some of the ladies will talk on that um, uh, today as well, because I think this incompatible roles of family and business has even been more difficult um, during COVID, uh, because many women or most women, all women had to work from home while also running a family. Then you still have the gender gap. So um, even if this uh, gap is changing, it still exists in, in, especially in the business world. And the woman is often not seen as the entrepreneur, but uh, suppliers, et cetera, turn to the male um, owners or people in the family business. Then uh, also interpersonal dynamics can be very volatile. Um, I experienced that a lot with my clients that you have a daughter that's feeling frustrated because the brothers are uh, assigned the successor roles, or, if you, or you have the inactive sister-in-laws who actually makes a lot of trouble. And sometimes they have to take over the business. I just had a client on the weekend where the brother uh, died unexpectedly, and now the sister-in-law is the only one in the business left, and she must run the business now um, while the sisters whose professional people are not that happy at all with regard to that. And then also a, a, a challenge that women tell us is power. Power is often a dirty word for women. They don't like to, you know, be powerful because they feel then, um, you know, it, 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 it affects their femininity because that's a problem. Then many women uh, marry into a family business and they feel they're not really trained to handle uh, what is expected of them. Then there's other challenges, and I'm quickly going to summarize that. It's the satisfaction with job, marriage, and life. Uh, the trying pressure of running an entrepreneurial venture and looking after the family. Sometimes you build your business when your children are very small. And then it's often a lack of family support, um, you know, that creates a, a tension level. Another research project um, showed us very, diff uh, very clearly that 60% of respondents are not able to find a balance between their personal and professional life. Thank you very much for that, um, Elmarie. Very interesting themes that have come out. The concept of multiple roles of women, invisible roles of women, role conflicts, the role of in-laws, and what have you. Um, I'd like to turn over to the ladies in the family businesses, the family business owners, Doris, you work in a construction industry. So how do you cope as a woman in a male dominated industry? What challenges do you face? Do you find that you're treated any differently by customers or suppliers? 
So yes, uh, I am in the construction business um, as a female. And as you rightly said, it is a male dominated uh, sector. But what I find um, from my experience is that, you know, you could be ignored uh, as a female or and, and the like, but then when you're competent in what you're doing, when you know your job, when you give in that extra and you're diligent, um, that cannot be uh, easily ignored. So I try to um, get knowledge as I you know, can about my sector and about my role. So I think just acquiring enough knowledge, not just about my role, but you know, about the whole sector in general and the different roles that um, come into play um, in, the, in the sector, that helps me because it actually um, basically goes um, into how people relate to you and how they respect you or how they respond to you. Then um, I try to act like one of the boys. So um, in a family of four, I'm the only girl. So, you know, I'm used to just hanging out with the boys and acting like them. So that helps, you know, you just do what it is you have to do. Like you're not thinking, am I a woman? Should I act this way? You're just acting like one of the boys. Um, again, you know, what helps is also just finding the right mentors, you know, other women who are in the sector doing well and trying to find out how they're coping and basically implementing that and having a, you know the right support group, that helps. Another thing that has helped me is not to be competitive. You know, I would say just being a team player, you know, teamwork is really the watchword and not trying to outdo anyone or trying to prove a point because you're a woman. Um, I don't do that. You know, I just uh, believe that if I have a task, and I need to reach out to other people, male or female, I just do that. Um, yes, yeah, so just having the right mentors, just the support groups, you know, being diligent and competent in what you're doing helps with that. The challenges, you know, that I have had, basically, it's just acceptance. So in my part of the world, in Nigeria, in, in this, you know, um, it's still a patriarchal society, right? So, you know, you have a lot of men that are not used to women in leadership position. So when I did take over, it was a struggle for some of them. I had some employees leave the company. I had some who were just not uh, cooperating with me or taking instructions when they needed to. Um, so that was the first challenge I had in people just accepting that I was a woman. I was the boss lady. Um, so I had that. And then just, you know, there were not that many, there are not too many women in my position in my sector. There's just basically less than a handful. So just um, finding the right mentor or just finding the right support group was a bit difficult. Um, you know, I had to reach out to them. And then just knowing the opportunities out there for women was uh, very, it, it wasn't easy to, to access. Um, so I had to work on that. I started reaching out to women. I started doing a lot of um, uh, seminars and, and workshops and just basically letting other women know what the opportunities are in, um, in the sector. And then I found out that there weren't that many, in fact, there was nothing like the, there were no gender policy, um, gender sensitive policies or gender inclusion policies in the company, flexible working hours and as such. So I had to make changes to, to that when I did um, get into the leadership role. So those were a few challenges I had just coming into um, this role that I have now. Thank you for sharing that. Um... And Tandeka, I'm intrigued to know more about your role in your family business. Do you have to fulfill multiple roles? And I guess just an overview of your story and any challenges you also face as a female. Uh, thank you, Nike. Uh, with regards to myself, I actually wear two hats. Um, uh, I'm firstly the CEO of Nobanjinji Family Property, uh, which is a commercial property group. Um, we spend reach and uh, residential uh, portfolios. Um, that is a first-generation um, uh, company uh, which my late father formed. Um, with regards to that company, um, you know, I've faced a lot of um, uh, different challenges. Firstly, because um, my late brother was actually the one who was uh, meant to be, you know, the successor of that family business. Um, obviously, because he 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 is you know um, uh, the eldest uh, son in the family, and um, when my father uh, passed on, um, it, it's unfortunate. My brother actually passed on uh, uh, prior uh, to my father, 
and um, you know, growing up because you know I was always that girl that never wanted to stay behind at home, um, even though my dad preferred you know to take my brothers with him whenever he would um, uh, go to. But I would actually force to go with him, and uh, with traveling with him, uh, uh, going to work, I literally got to be you know his right hand woman. Um, you know, and um, uh, as we, you know, as we, uh, life progressed, um, my brother passed on, unfortunately, and um, then I had to step in, you know, and take that role that my brother used to fulfill. Um, and that was when I really got to learn about the, 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 the industry because my father was also a property developer. So that's where my love for construction started. Um, and hence, uh, later, years later, um, after taking over the, the commercial property business, um, I realized that there was something and I felt that I actually wanted to uh, fulfill, you know, that gap of wanting to get into, um, uh, into, into construction. So hence, I started to open up my own construction company, which I named Bogoto Building, uh, because I realized its uh, uh, difficulties of females to enter into the sector. And as Doris said, um, you know, um, it's much more difficult for us as females to be able to participate in many sectors such as construction. So, you know, the way I, 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 I packaged my company was in a way where we would uh, make sure that females, you know, form part of an equitable and inclusive part of the construction sector. And um, that is where, you know, I'm, I w that's my second hat that I wear in Bogota building where I'm the MD of, of that construction company. Um, in, in all the years that, uh, you know, I've been running the family businesses, um, I realized that it's very difficult as a female, uh, firstly, because, um, you know, there's a, a huge um, a gender gap. Um, and not only that, um, there's also, you know, uh, issues with, you know, uh, with, with, uh, with, with the age um, issue. Um, I found myself that I would have to, uh, have the, the people that basically raised me, you know, um, which I used to, I, I grew up calling uncle and, um, you know, they had to report to me at some point. And they weren't too happy with that, uh, with that situation of having to report to a younger um, uh, uh, individual. So, you know, um, you know, I've had to make sure that uh, in whatever way that I'm, I carry on with my business, I ensure that, first of all, they need to respect me as an individual and they need to respect me as a businesswoman uh, prior to them seeing me as um, my late father's daughter. So, you know, we've had to bridge those uh, uh, difficult gaps. Um, and um, now we add up, a, you know, we have a mutual understanding. And as Doris did say, you know, um, it's only your work that can speak for itself. And you have to prove yourself. Although it is a bit unfair that as a female, you have to prove 10 times, you know, more than um, our male counterparts. Uh, I have a long way to go, uh, but, you know, um, things are getting better as, you know, time uh, progresses. Thank you for sharing that, Dandeka. Um, I'll move over to Victoria. Um, why are women often not owners in family businesses and what can they do to overcome this challenge? I mean, I'm going to echo quite a few things there from the ladies that have already spoken. and. Of course, there's many more women owners and CEOs now than we've had in the past, but you see it very much as a kind of transitional phase at the moment. And depending on what type of industry you're in, um, you know, we've heard from two ladies in the construction industry, um, you know, or geographically where you are, because some of these things are going to be either um, at the very start of the transitional phase or, you know, nearing the finish line. Firstly, you know, there's, there's been a lot of um, legal issues. Money hasn't always been able to flow to women uh, legally, and it's needed changes in the law to allow this to happen. You've 
I mean, you've only got to look at places, for example, like India, you've got the Hindu Succession Act in 2005. It's the first time women could actually legally own land. Now, how can you run a factory, run a business there if you can't actually own the land on which it's on? So, and that's not that long ago in the past. And actually, one of the other examples, I think, would be quite shocking to young people is, I mean, in the UK, if you think about it, it wasn't until 1975 that women could have a bank account in their own name without the permission of their husband or a male relative. And that's not that long ago. So when you put it in that sort of context, you're starting from a very late historical base um, to propel women in business. You know, men have had hundreds of years to get to the place where they are. And women has really only had a relatively short time. Uh, secondly, as um, Al Marie said, you know, women are very much the homemaker. Um, whether they are going to be the homemaker or whether it's just the perception of it, it's still there. And for those women that are mothers, um, you know, they're going to go through a lot of changes and it's a, a role in itself. It's, that's a big change mentally and physically. And that takes time out of running a business. So you've got that to cope with yourself, but you've also got the perception of other people of like, well, is, is that person going to be up to the job to do that? Um, and it's that can be a hard balance to find as well. And I think that a lot of people, a lot of women may have got sort of overlooked by the family, the males in the family, but also by advisors, because you think about it, if men were running businesses, a lot of those advisors were men as well. So there's two sets of things to actually break down from the start um, but it, it means not the case everywhere you look at places like Sweden they are sort of more inclusive um, especially with say like paternity leave and maternity leave there's more sharing there um, but in a way to overcome it and I think many uh, the ladies have touched on it already is that I think the first thing is that wanting it and believing that you can be the owner of the business is the first hurdle um and you know i think a lot of the times we've mentioned power um women have to be care they have to be careful with how they use power um to be confident and not seem arrogant but to also kind of get where that cloak of confidence you know people want a strong leader women have to give that and they have to deliver that in a way um, and I think to help with that, often I recommend to, to clients can be sort of to have coaching sessions as well, um, in terms of from people like positive psychologists, um, to have fine mentors, you know, people like Nancy, um, that can help bring women up and, and understand how they can thrive in business. Tendeka actually said this already, of like, actually, you know, ask questions, show interest, the younger this starts in the family, the better, and, and really push for it so that actually, you know, the older generation see that you are interested, that you want to be part of that business, you want to find out about it, and that you're there for the long term. Um, creating your own network of advisors. Um, women often create fantastic um, support networks and just use them as a way to bounce ideas off each other. Women are very collaborative, um, and they can use that skill and bring that into the business. And ultimately, at the end of the day, don't give up. Excellent, excellent um, overview, particularly of the historical context of where women are coming from, the legal impediments that they've had to overcome and contributing to where we are today. I'd like to ask Nancy, you're an advocate for mentorship and women upliftment. What advice could you give women to make sure that they have their rightful place concerning ownership and management in their family businesses? I think the starting point is that, you know, we have to recognise as women that we are different from men. And I think uh, for a lot of the younger women, um, in a really positive way, you know, they grow up thinking the world is equal. But as they get older, they realise the world is, you know, it's not equal. So they're going to have to um, find different ways to create uh, more opportunities for them so that they can benefit uh, in the same way as men do, both in terms of the management of the businesses as well as being owners of businesses. 
So I think the three main points I like to share. I think the first point is I would advise women not be too self-critical. I think women tend to have a lot of self-doubt. They tend to be their own biggest critic. You know, they they like to、um, doubt themselves even when others don't do it.、Um, and you know, you often hear that, for example, a woman、um, wouldn't apply for a job unless. They satisfy a hundred percent of all the criteria for job, whereas a man would apply for a position even if they can meet only sixty percent、um, of, of the conditions.、Um, and you know, and for a lot of women, their starting position is is very different. They assume that, in particular, all the men tend to know more than they do. Whereas in fact,、um, they are very competent. You know, from the story shared by. Doris、um, and also Thandeka, you know, you're very competent women. So、um, one shouldn't assume that、um, you know a man、um, would know more than you by、um, challenging ourselves、um, and the self doubt we have as women.、Um, we 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 would then have more courage to apply for the more senior roles.、Um, and the next point is、um, don't be afraid to make、uh, the mistakes. Because women, by nature, like to have everything done in the perfect way.、Uh, we are very conservative and very cautious. Whereas men, they take more risks. Of course, you know, not all women are like that. Some women like to take more risks, but you know, as、um, a very broad comment, that tends to be the trend. So、um, my advice would be: don't assume that everything needs to be absolutely perfect the first time round. It's okay to make a mistake. And if you do make a mistake, don't be too hard on yourself. That is how we learn. And so I say, you know, take chances, make mistakes,、um, and that is how you grow. And finally, the third point is、um, something that has been mentioned by by several of you already:、um, finding a female mentor. You know, I really believe very strongly in this.、Um, when it comes to finding mentors, I think for women who want to be in business, it's so important to find a female mentor rather than a male one. And the reason is exactly how some of you have described. You know, as women, we've got、um, different roles、um, in our lives.、Um, we are quite often the primary carers. And our families, but also we want to succeed in business as well.、Um, so you need to find somebody who has gone through that journey in order to relate to what you're going through. Whereas, you know, yes, if you were to find a male mentor, they would be very successful in business. But it's very likely that they probably have、um, a stay-at-home wife, or you know, they wouldn't necessarily have had to juggle、um, the you know the competing interests between children and business.、Um, and you know, I fully agree with the point that's just been made by Victoria that in many countries it hasn't been that long ago、uh, since you know women haven't been able to. Have the same succession rights as well as the rights to、um, to to participate in in businesses, and so while a lot of those legal impediments have been lifted, don't forget you know there's still the social and the cultural biases that women have to deal with, and so it's about finding somebody who has been through that journey who you can relate to, who can help you. To go through and 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 overcome some of these huge challenges that that we face as women,、um, and you know by by doing that, it, it's so important to have that support network in order to work through these huge hurdles. Thank you,、um, Nancy. Really insightful.、Um, On to Victoria. I'd like to know more. What are you seeing with your clients in terms of? Challenges that women and family businesses are facing. Are there any generational differences, and、um, how can families seek to transition the process between the next gen and the older gen in a business and wealth transfer? Well, I'd say sort of the first hurdle for some women can just be being heard、um, and in a constructive way. Uh, as El Marie actually touched on it, first off, you know, being more than that emotional leader,、um, there are sort of certain roles that women have been placed into.、Um, just it's been good to see 
clients um, and their families with women involved in the business actually turn that on its head, use that to an advantage. You know, women can read people much better. You know, they're, they're good at being collaborative, being team players, and they can create a motivated and engaged workforce. So some of these things, it's about using coaching elements and things in there to actually turn what could be a negative into a positive and using those skills to come further into the business. Um, in terms of generational dis- difference, um, I mentioned it before, You know, the fact that, yes, men have largely run the businesses and their advisors have also been male. So that, that's a, a hurdle that people are still having to overcome. But you look deeper. I mean, women have made important financial decisions for a long time, just behind the scenes of the business. So they're now sort of coming forward um, and, you know, it's, it's not having to hide behind men anymore. They're, they're at the forefront of the business. But in terms of helping marry the old gen with the, with the next gen, really, in terms of wealth transfer and transfer of the business, the biggest thing there, I think, is having empathy on both sides. Um, and it's allowed... So the older generation, they have to open up and let the younger generation actually show them what they know you know it's not all about younger generation learning from older generation younger generation you know they know some stuff the old ones don't you know typical examples technology um, but they also can watch trends much better so and it's just again allow them to fail in a safe way and allow them to succeed as well um, but the other thing is that i think that the next generation need to have sympathy and sort of understanding for their parents. You know, at the end of the day, um, they're their children. And it's it's quite hard because they're sort of having to acknowledge that they're getting older um, and themselves. So there's something there that they have to allow that the older generation have to let go of something. And it's quite hard to have sympathy as a younger person on that notice. Um, You know, and also the business, if it's been set up by them, you know, that as well is their baby. And you've got to kind of treat it with respect. If you've got ideas, you'll come forward with them and come forward with a business plan. Act as though you are a third party, not a family member. You're actually going to have to work harder in a way, because you are a family member, that's often how it happens, but show that you're really serious and then they'll start to take notice. Um, and, you know, I encourage my clients to look forward to introduce them, their children early to a business, um, take them round the factory, take them round the office, get them, you know, if you're having a dinner party, you know, get the get the children there, say hello to people, get them used to all these things from a very early age and they can sort of, it becomes natural then. Um, And also, you know, it might be the child doesn't want to go into the family business, um, but they've been given an opportunity early on and sort of been absorbed into it in in a good way. So they've got a great basis. I mean, a colleague of mine, a former lawyer, she said one day she walked into her boss's office and his daughter was sat there at the desk and looking and thinking what's what's she doing and she's she's drawing a load of boxes out with lines and suddenly she's like that's a massive asset structure chart for trusts and companies and it's like because she'd been doing her homework at the desk and then watching what her father did you know and actually learning how to do wealth planning for individuals at a very young age so (laughs) it's like you know it became a natural thing in, in that sense so i just think introduce people early have empathy and the other thing is families they fight they always do they bicker siblings bicker all the time it's not always going to go smoothly thank you so much um victoria um and sissy as a family business consultant i'd be intrigued to know how can we prepare the next generation to have both a voice and a vote and how can we protect the legacy of family businesses through governance Thank you, Nikkei, and um, thank you to all the other panellists. I think a lot of what they said contribute to my answer. When we're looking at family businesses and next gen, it's a topical subject that keeps on coming up generation after generation. And one of the highlights of that is building trust and starting early, 
um, you can see from the stories that the other panelists have shared when they started early, when that trust has started being built from a young age, the next gen feel comfortable. They feel comfortable contributing. They feel comfortable participating. It doesn't become as much as a challenge when they're faced with it because they feel like they've been prepared for it and they have been walking next to the founder. They've been walking next to their peers. They've been walking next to the people then they have to oversee and work with or work above. And they become part of the team as opposed to being an outsider coming in. It's very difficult when you are next gen because you're obviously trying to some extent to fill in shoes that have built a company or have taken a company from one stage to a higher stage. And you're walking in and sometimes it feels like you're an imposter. Can I do this job? Am I capable of doing this job? No matter how educated you are, no matter how much experience you've had, the prospect of leadership in itself can be a daunting task and can be a heavy one because sometimes you do truly feel alone. And as a next gen, you don't only carry the expectations of the family, but you're also carrying the expectations of the employees and the communities that the company serves. So that in itself can be a very difficult task for the founder generations and the current generations. The trust building in itself, because I can only imagine when you've held a child in your arms, you've seen them from pregnancy to birth and you've raised them, you've seen their weaknesses and their strengths. And now all of a sudden you have to give over a company that you have been running or building from scratch and you're feeling like a passenger in a vehicle when you have a learner driver next to you, but you just don't have the brakes. That in itself can be a very, very scary experience. But we all know that we get past that for the learner to become an experienced driver. They have to sit in that driver's seat. They have to learn from driving and they have to make their own mistakes because we're not going to make the same mistakes. We're not going to run the same race. It's going to be different with each generation, the challenges that we face, the errors that we live in, and also the different translations of what's going on is very specific to our generation and what it is that we're having to face. And when you look at governance, it's all very much anchored on communication. Communication is difficult. It's one of those things where you're always trying to gauge if the other person is ready to hear what you have to say. And sometimes you hear something through your own filter. And when you're family members, you're trying not to hurt the other family member and you're trying to go gently all the time. Sometimes the truth is necessary. Sometimes the bluntness of the truth is what's going to get us past the difficultness. And speaking the truth all the time is necessary, especially when it comes to family governance and allowing the other person to see from your viewpoint, as well as being empathetic enough to look at the other person and understand from their viewpoint where they're coming from. Wow, thank you so much for that, Sissy. Um, I'd like to hear from Doris, you know, what's been your experience in terms of intergenerational leadership, integrating into the family business, you know, your journey in taking over, um, to share more about how, you know, the practical in terms of being a next gen. Yes. So for me, um, I just want to say that the transition is a process um, and it has to go through that process. The process for me was gradual. It wasn't uh, instantaneous. So. Uh, my father, who happened to be the chairman, um, he started early. So, you know, I think about, you know, I've been in the company for over uh, 15 years. So right from the beginning, he would take me for meetings. He would, um, I was in every meeting. Um, I actually joined the company as a company secretary, uh, legal advisor. So he wanted me to go through the, you know, the whole process. He didn't just want me to be a director uh, automatically. So I had to go to sites, I had to sit, up, sit in the meetings, didn't matter what meeting it was, like, whether I was interested or not, but I, I, you know, I had to, it was compulsory for me. And then with meetings with clients, you know, with suppliers, I had to also uh, be part of that. Um, he encouraged me to take courses, um, you know, dealing with construction and, you know, I had to go back to school to learn construction law. So it was a process for me, it was a gradual process. And, you know, he midwifed the whole transition. 
you know, he still every now and then, you know, has an oversight function. Um, but I remember that we had to, you know, form a team. So the, you know, doc proper documentation had to be done. We had financial advisors, we had legal advisors, you know, we had people that, you know, uh, team was formed, which actually um, helped us, you know, transition uh, smoothly. Um, so it was a gradual process. Um, right now, we just basically go to him for just advice or, you know, if we were stuck on something, if there was a difficult situation, then he would make it one or two calls. Um, yeah, so that was how it was for me. It was a, it was a very gradual, um, smooth process. It wasn't contentious. Um, by the time he left, everybody knew what they were supposed to do. So my brothers and I, we sort of were, you know, we, we were assigned specific roles, you know, as directors or um, board members. So we do have other people on the board, um, but that helped. You know, it helped that we all knew what we were supposed to do before he basically exited uh, permanently. Tandeka, can you share a bit? You, you spoke a little bit about your journey um, in joining the family business. Um, can you share a bit more on leadership, um, integrating and, and yeah, taking over the family business? It, it was a bit tough for me because um, I basically got thrown into, you know, the position um, uh, because we, we, there wasn't any proper prior, you know, succession planning done um, because, you know, my dad had always thought that my, my brother, you know, would be the successor. And uh, with me taking over the role after my father on, um, it was quite, you know, abrupt um, because prior to that, you know, I was working independently um, because I did not actually want to be <laughs> uh, be part of the family business because I felt that I needed, you know, my own independence and needed to expand, you know, my horizons and get to learn um, from other organizations. Thank you for that. Um, we'll now switch to mental health. And um, Sissy, I'd like to know how is mental health affecting family businesses, particularly in these times? I think the topic of mental health has been a really big one where people are becoming more aware of the fact that we just don't live within the parameters of systems and processes um, that run our businesses, but that our mental well-being is very important as to how we show up every day in our offices, in our relationships as well, is in the way we operate on a professional level. A lot of family businesses have struggled during this time because with the global pandemic, we obviously have seen a lot of loss from especially founders who've passed away and left businesses floating and next gens unable to process the emotional trauma of losing a family member as well as a leader and then having to take over a family business and feeling the pressure of having to step into the founder or the late current gen's shoes. That in itself has been difficult and trying to process it individually and as families hasn't been an easy one because you don't know where to start. We haven't, we haven't naturally been prepared to deal with mental health. Indeed. Um, Victoria, do you have any insights to share on this, how women can cope better in this area of mental health? You know, a lot of women, they do suffer from sort of what we term sort of high functioning anxiety. And it can be really, really well hidden. And it, it does derive, I think, in part just some genetic makeup, but also all the roles women have to do. And you now I'm I'm somebody that does suffer from that. Um, and for me, because of the multiple roles that I play, then sometimes it can get too much. And it's like surfing on a massive wave. And you know that if you don't keep your balance, um, you're going to drown. And it's really frightening when it happens. And out of that, you can get your no eating, no sleeping, and it just, and like basically the wheels can come off the bus because your brain's going into overdrive. And I, I think it really is the thing that happens to a lot of women because of, as I said, these multiple 
roles, the wife, the mother, the cook, the cleaner, the business owner and the multiple roles even within the business. To, to stop that, um, you know, it's, it's that thing of setting boundaries for yourself, you know, say, I am going to stop. And even if it's four, ten minutes, it's very difficult in a family business. Um, but just say, no, I'm stopping at this time. And just being present in that moment, having that time for you or for your family, just even if it's 15 minutes to give yourself that time out. Thank you for your tips there, um, Victoria. I'm going to go around to all of the ladies. This has been a really powerful session with, you've all been very generous with your experience and your expertise and insights to share what lessons you've learned along your journey um, and how you, you maintain a work-life balance. So I'll start over with Elmarie. It's been awesome listening to you. Um, I wish I had this type of advice 30 years back when I started my career because it's just amazing how the new generation and the younger people handle all of these things. You know, um, it, it's something that is really something to celebrate. So I, I thank you very much. I've, I learned a lot. And uh, as I say, I think it's amazing that you can get this type of advice, you know, early in your career. Um, I have two things. Um, it's not uh, different to what the ladies have said, but I, I, I want to perhaps just, um, I work a lot with Nika and Titi on other um, forums. And I, I think like with succession and governance, there's no one size fits all. You know, when I listen to Doris and Nancy and Patricia and Ndeka and Titi and, and, and Nika, I know you as well. Uh, you know, you, have, you still have different circumstances. You operate from a different culture. And I really want to encourage all of you, if you haven't done it, do the strength finder. Because I think um, the last four years I do that with my clients. We do that when we do consultation training, SLPs. Because I don't want to mention the word actually weaknesses. I think all of us have strengths, but you need to know what they are. You need to know what are the dominating strengths. As, as uh, I think it was um, Doris that said, you know, just be authentic. But uh, if, you, if you operate on your strengths, then you also um, have a lot more credibility. And as uh, I think it was Tindeka that said, you know, um, it, it's a process and, um, you know, it's not always going well. And sometimes you're accepted, sometimes you're praised and other times, you know, you just get it from all sides. And uh, thank you, Patricia. I also went through a similar thing four years back. And then uh, what Nancy repeatedly said and also UTT is that I think it's important to ask advice and to leverage your networks. Um, you know, it's being amazing, uh, the exposure that we all have to amazing women like yourself. So I think uh, ask for advice, set boundaries like um, you mentioned. And um, yeah, and I think just enjoy being a woman, you know. Um, we have natural gifts and talents and communication skills and, you know, that men can never have. So go for it, ladies. Thank you, Elmarie. Um, Sissy? I think I would just like to echo what Al-Marie said. Um, it, one that we're facing is a journey. It's not a destination. Um, every one of the panelists shared their input and how they've navigated what they've seen and what they've come through. I think if, if we take what everyone has said and then look for our own paths with this knowledge and share it with others, we'll be able to navigate this journey, learn from each other, as well as to create resources for the next gens that are coming up because surely they're going to be stronger because of access to all this knowledge and the ability that we can share it with them. And we are also learning in, in our transition and as we also teach them. Thank you, Sissy. Um, Tandeko? My piece of advice is that always know that owes you anything. Um, you are the only person responsible for your journey. Every journey is, is different. Never compare yourself to others because we all experience, um, you know, chips and difficulties in different manners. Um, always seek advice from those who followed the path before you did. Um, keep those people as mentors because no one will give you better guidance as those who have walked the journey be, uh, before you. And um, uh, the last uh, one I can say is that as females, um, I feel that it's quite imperative that we 
um, uh, stick together. And when there are opportunities, let's open up opportunities for other females because if we don't do it for ourselves, who else is going to do it? It's only up to us to, you know, uh, propel and assist uh, in, 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 in growing, you know, um, you know, the females in our different sectors. Thank you, Nancy. I echo what everybody has said, you know, I think the most exciting thing about this being a journey is the fact that um, it can go up, it can go down, you know, no two days are exactly the same. Um, and I think by talking about all these issues um, with, with each other, we learn so much as well. Um, and I find that ex extremely exciting. Excellent. Um, and Victoria? Just two things. Uh, I just say have empathy. That's you know, for your older generation, your younger generation, your workers. You know, people hide a lot of things. They go through a lot of things. Just be sensitive and um, it'll make your journey a lot easier. And the other thing is be brave, be confident. Women are amazing. And just, you know, we've got, as um, I think Elmer and that said, we've got talents that men don't have. Um, so let's use those strengths and um, just make this an incredible journey and get more women into business. And Doris, can you also share what lessons you've learned along your journey and um, how you maintain a work-life balance? So for me, um, work-life balance changes from day to day. It's never the same. Um, so I just try to manage my time. I try to prioritize um, what is important, what can be left for later. I set limits on, you know, the tax for today, for that day. And then for me, you know, when I leave work, I leave work. So I have tried to take work home, but that didn't work. So I just, you know, when I get home, I try to have quality time with family. I take all my vacation time and, and more. <laughs> and then, of course, I delegate. So I think it's very important to, to delegate, to have um, helpers, domestic staff, PAs, SAs, advisors, just give everyone something to do so that you have, uh, you can concentrate on the core, on your core uh, roles and responsibility. And I think it's very important to just be deliberate. So you want to be deliberate and sort of just taking time out in a week, just going out with friends, letting your hair down, um, exercising, you know, sleeping well. You know, if you do need to take the day off or two or three or even the whole week, why not, you know, at this level? So I just try to find out what works for me and then I implement it. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been a powerful session, sharing your experiences, your expertise and your your journeys. Thank you so much for your generosity. I think um, I love um, Elmarie and Victoria's comments on leveraging and cultivating our strengths and using that to forge forward into the future. That can be our lesson for, for today. Thank you so much.